Okay, thanks everybody for joining us. And today we'll have Professor Michael Baraka, who's an associate professor with the Department of Urban Horticulture and Design at the Farmingdale State College. Um, we've had him before with our summer students. He's amazing in terms of uh, being able to talk about both his work at the college as well as uh, the importance of sustainable landscaping. Uh, important thing about uh, why he's here with our summer students is uh, many of you are, of course, looking at careers or thinking about careers at this point in time. So good idea to put seed to this, uh, new ideas in your head about potential and possibilities and the kinds of things that you could be doing. So without further ado, let me hand it over to uh, Professor Varaka here. Well, thank you, Raju. Can everybody hear me and see my screen now? Yes. Yeah. All right, super. Uh, <clears throat> so first and foremost, thank you for inviting me. Um, once again, I was pleased to speak with all of uh, you last year or those of you who were a part of the program last year. Um, <clears throat> and as Raju mentioned, um, you know, I'm a professor at Farmingdale and um, one of my passions is really is to connect uh, my students with real world projects. And um, so what I really wanna talk about today, and, and I'm impressed already looking at the calendar of the activities that you're doing, is to impress within uh, your uh, minds that uh, everything that you do in life really can impact others. Not only will it impact your own uh, ability to learn and grow and be a happy person, but you can really make uh, a difference in the lives of others. And um, we know that sometimes that feels kind of trite. You know, we get lost in the soup of society. Um, but I really strongly believe um, that the activities that you're doing, the, the, um, the thought-provoking ideas that you might be learning in school and in uh, these projects, uh, will propel you forward and will make others around you uh, happier people. So what we're going to talk a little bit about for the next 40 minutes or so are some of the things that you could do and you already are doing, but maybe you can put them into, um, uh, you know, a new way of thinking about it. And, um, and of course, I'd like to consider that someday you might want to further your studies and come to Farmingdale State College. So... Uh, really what I'm talking about is creating a lifestyle that um, treads lightly on the earth. And we typically call this sustainability. And um, it's a really big word. It's a buzzword. And it's really hard to live a truly sustainable lifestyle. And by the way, if anybody wants to ask questions during um, this little talk, or if you have, um, I might ask you some questions if you want to pipe in and answer. I would love that. You know, I don't want this just to be a, a one sided discussion. So, if you really want to think about being sustainable, what's a good starting point for doing that? Can, can anybody pipe in and give me a suggestion as to, you know, uh, how you can be more sustainable in your life? Maybe when you're, when you're um, use, not using any electronics, you could unplug them? Yeah, that's a very good thing. You know, energy is a huge thing um, in the world today. You know, we, we, you may have heard about this idea about a Green New Deal, which is to produce all of the energy we need or as much of it as possible from renewable sources, whether that be wind or solar. Uh, or water power. Um, so um, it's really important to think about how you can literally unplug and save energy. No question about it. Anybody have another idea about 
how you could become more sustainable in the things that you do on a regular basis. Try to compost like leftover food instead of just throwing it away. That's awesome. Yes. I mean, um, the best thing to do uh, would be to not take food that you don't, that you can't personally eat. But of course, if you're growing food and I see that you're doing some activities with food, um, to return those food scraps or plant parts back into the ground and to make soil is a uh, fantastic approach to being more sustainable. So stopping the waste stream, being more energy conscious, totally great things to do. Anybody have one other idea before we get going? Well, I'll tell you what my idea is to, it would be to grow some food. Uh, as a former farmer, uh, I was a farmer in Rhode Island um, for uh, about 10 years before I got into teaching. Um, if you can grow a portion of your own food, you'll definitely be more sustainable. So if you can see this little slide here, on the left-hand side are some of the typical ways that we, uh, as Americans, receive food that we eat. So uh, if you look at this little chart here, probably a lot of people go to the supermarket. And that's a very long chain because the food comes from literally all over the world. Uh, it has to be picked. It has some cases it has to be processed. Then it has to be uh, cooled and shipped and delivered. And then maybe even repackaged and put into your store. So some of the other examples of food chains on the left um, are things that you may um, uh, be doing already. You may go to a farmer's market, you know, here on Long Island, and I know in Port Washington, there are farmer's markets. Um, so you might go there when uh, they're in season and purchase food directly from a farmer. Uh, you might go one step more than that, and you might actually become a member of a farm, which we call community-supported agriculture. Um, and that's a nice way to guarantee that you're going to help the farmer and receive some of your own uh, good fresh food. You might do a food delivery service. You know, a lot of people were doing that when the pandemic was really bad. Um, and actually, you know, you might grow a portion of your own food in your own home garden or community garden. So that's a great way to learn about uh, all the things that really impact um, what we call our carbon footprint on the planet, right? So using food as a mechanism, one of the things that I like to explore with my students, um, and you may be curious about this too, is you know, here we live in New York State, but how much of the food that we eat on a regular basis actually comes from New York State? Does anybody know? Yeah. The reality is we do grow a lot of food on Long Island, but we don't have enough food that we're growing here to feed everybody on Long Island. So we do rely upon a, um, a regional food production and distribution system, and we do rely upon a global food production system. And so that makes you begin to then, if you investigate it, think about, well, what's the quality of that food? Um, and uh, what's the impact on the planet when we grow food that way? So we know that you can get any kind of food that you want. You know, if you have money um, here in the Western society in the New York State area, fast food's everywhere, right? And a lot of students in college eat fast food. Sometimes I eat fast food. Uh, <clears throat> but you might wonder, well, where does all this, you know, plethora of food come from? And so if you really want to dig into this, you know, the New York State Agricultural um, uh, Department has all kinds of statistics. You're going to have a copy of this um, uh, talk and you can look up some of these uh, websites. And it's kind of interesting. They'll break it down crop by crop. And what you'll learn, though, is that New York State only grows about two and a half percent. No, I'm sorry. We only have about two and a half percent of the nation's farmland. And we only grow about 15% of our own food. So that's kind of scary. We have, you know, we're, we're, we're fairly thrifty um, and we have some good land for growing, 
but we're not um, really growing enough food to take care of ourselves. So when we have an issue like a pandemic, boy, things can really get out of, uh, uh, out of whack. And you might recall last year, uh, especially in the spring of 2020, when things first happened, that in some cases it was very difficult to get food. So what you have to realize is that most of the food's not coming from uh, our local area, it's coming from someplace else. So there are many places in this country where we grow food and also food comes from other parts of the world. So Central and South America, uh, New Zealand, Australia, Asia are some of the places. And so we, we found out in the pandemic, right? Um, that when these markets get disrupted, um, literally because people don't feel safe to be around others or transportation uh, and fuels uh, are interrupted and, and of course weather, um, then uh, we are very vulnerable to not having food. So again, I'm bringing all this up with the idea that if you wanna be more sustainable and you wanna think about how you could, one of the things to think about and investigate and explore is this whole idea of where your food comes from. Now, when we get food from uh, corporate farms, they're not so concerned about sustainability. You know, they're looking for production. So it's very petrochemical based. Um, if, particularly if it's coming from outside of the United States, there could be a lot of harmful uh, pesticides and herbicides. <clears throat> we call that the circle of poison. Even when it's grown in this country in large scale farming practices, sometimes you may have heard of contaminants that get into food. Um, and oftentimes that's E. coli. Um, and so um, all of this can really, um, you know, sort of begin to well up and we, be, we can begin to understand that maybe the food that we eat on a regular basis is not really fresh. It might not be nut uh, nutritional and it's certainly not local. So um, I'm happy to hear you're working on food production, you're working in gardens where you're growing food. So you're learning firsthand what it takes to grow food. And of course, it's not easy to grow food. Um, but I think, you know, when you start to grow food, you become what I call a better eater. And when you become a better eater, what I simply mean by that is you're eating fresh food, uh, if you didn't grow it, hopefully you came from a local source, a local farmer, and you're connecting the dots, if you will, to how food is grown, to how it becomes available, and how you might cook with it. And in the process of doing all that, you learn some great personal skills, and you learn all about sustainability. So first and foremost, that's really what I wanted to kind of talk about today. And uh, if you're new to all this, or if you want to expand upon all of this, um, you know, the great way about thinking about growing food is you can grow a lot of uh, crops that maybe, maybe you can't find in stores. So if you're already exploring the idea of growing food, you may know about heirloom vegetables as an example. And heirloom vegetables um, are old fashioned vegetables. They may, may have, um, less resistance to certain, um, you know, diseases or even pests, um, but they are um, old fashioned crops that really taste good. They weren't designed to be shipped or all picked at once. Um, and so if you use, if you like tomatoes, as an example, you may know about heirloom tomatoes and some of them are incredibly juicy and, and tasty. So, um, you know, the great thing about um, growing some of your own food is you can tailor what you want to grow. It can be tastier, uh, more nutritional, and of course, it's going to be fresher. So getting back to the idea of, you know, altering your lifestyle and thinking about how you can tread lightly or on the planet and be healthier and make uh, an impact here are some principles that I like to follow and I encourage my students at Farmingdale to follow them. And they actually come from um, uh, an international website called the Sustainable Sites Initiative. And there'll be a link into that uh, group a little bit later on. So you can read all of these yourself, but essentially um, 
what we're trying to think about is that when, no matter what we can do in life, if we can um, really think about supporting a, a systematic approach that's ethical, collaborative, um, that we create a series of decisions that will benefit um, and not cause harm, we can then support a living process. So agriculture is a great metaphor for that. And if you've ever been to a local farm, um, you know, on Long Island, you can really get an understanding of what it takes to grow food and how uh, the, the work that farmers do um, puts equity back into their land. And that allows the whole cycle to continue. So remember I asked at the beginning what sustainability really is, and here's a bunch of definitions. Um, and, you know, like I said before, they're very difficult to really achieve because it's hard, right? But the one that I really like um, is that, you know, what we're trying to do is contribute to human well-being, but at the same time, not destroy the natural environment. And we're really looking at a way to improve the quality of life. And we wanna do it for ourselves, but we wanna do it for future generations. You're the future. We need you to be sustainable. We need you to understand really what that means and to live a lifestyle that's going to improve um, our current life, but also make the world a better and more habitable place. So in the work that I do at Farmingdale, and it looks like the work that you all are doing right now, you're dealing with these issues right now. You're interfacing the world and the world is based upon water and soils. And then what we add to that um, are materials and, and plants, but in the middle of all that is us. And so everything that we do um, on this planet, you know, whether you do it individually or, you know, what you see as, as a systematic approach is dealing with natural resources and shaping um, the land and systems around us. And we hopefully can do that in a way that benefits us. And so uh, in the work that I do as a landscape architect and as a garden builder, what I try to uh, promote both in school and in my own professional practice is to teach people about how to make a healthy landscape. And so you might be saying, well, gee, I thought all landscapes were healthy. And what do you think about that? You know, where you live or work or drive around and you look at people's yards or shopping centers or school, uh, are all those landscapes healthy? What do you think? Anybody have an opinion on that? Well, I guess what we'd have to do is define what healthy is, right? So um, a healthy landscape provides not only benefits for us, but for all living beings. So we call those ecosystem services. Has anybody heard of that term before, ecosystem services? And what they, what they are, and I'll give you some examples of them in a moment, are things that make us healthier, happier, uh, allow us to function and to be um, well as human beings. So here are some of the categories that are defined as ecosystem services. Well, we need things that will make us actually survive. So we... That's the production of food and clean water. Now, we all know about climate change. Some people are questioning what are the causes of climate change, but we know if you follow the news, that there's been tremendous fires out West, there's been floods in Europe. Um, the, the climate that we live in very much affects the quality of our life. And we know that the ice caps are melting. We know that temperatures are warm. We're having a tremendously wet July. And we don't know if that's really climate change right now. That could be a quirk of weather. But the idea that, you know, having a healthy um, society and landscape means that we can mitigate flooding. We could plant 
trees as an example to uh, cool the greenhouse effect. Um, and by doing all of that, we're gonna be healthier people. Now that another uh, ecosystem service is this idea that was brought up before about composting. The idea that we can uh, return to the earth our waste products. We call that nutrient cycling. And if we wanna have any crops that we can eat, we need uh, pollinators to assist us. So you know a lot about, I think it sounds like, about native gardens and native plants and the connection of native insects and birds to um, uh, the plants around them. That's really important. And then lastly, but just as important is we want to be part of a world where there's beauty. So parks, um, recreation spaces, natural areas, whether they be, uh, you know, uh, the Grand Canyon or Yosemite or going upstate into New York or going to the coast of Long Island, um, that, that soothes us, that gives us a feeling that we're part of a larger system. It can be spiritual and that's really important as well. So in society now, this whole idea of ecosystem services is huge. Scientists, economists, politicians, they're all really interested. And some are quantifying now what these systems services are worth. And you know, virtually they're priceless, but if you really want, there have been people who have put um, dollar amounts on this. This is a pretty old study from 1997. We know that the goods and services um, that, um, promote ecosystem surface, uh, services are worth a lot. And so again, just to put it back into a framework, think about all of the things that you value, all of the things that you take for granted on a natural uh, daily basis are things that are interconnected. That the health of the planet is priceless and what we individually do, the choices we make can actually have an impact. So, you know, I don't know if everybody lives in a single family house here, if some of you live in uh, apartments or co-ops or condominiums, um, but I wanted to kind of show a couple of ideas of how people can make an impact. And you can make an impact later on perhaps by working in the field of horticulture uh, or agriculture or landscape architecture. So I'm showing a, a, you know, a house that could easily be in Port Washington. And it's a relatively small house. And I know you're just looking at a little photo and you might be wondering, well, why the hell is he showing me this? And why I'm showing it to you is that, you know, everybody's residential property um, can actually have an impact on many of the things that we've been talking about. So we're looking at this property and you can see it's kind of a house up on a little hill and um, the one thing that, the reason I put this on here is this, this is primarily a lawn-based landscape. And um, this summer we're having a lot of water. Most lawns are very green, but if you were having, if we were having a typical summer, um, lawns tend to burn up a lot in the summertime. And um, it's hard to, to mow a lawn on a slope like this. And when you really start to investigate lawns, some people will say, well, you know, they, they don't provide a lot of ecosystem services. Um, they require a lot of water to maintain. Some people would put lots of fertilizers and herbicides down. And could there be a, a more productive and maybe even interesting way to um, treat this property? And so again, going back to this idea of growing food and learning about what sustenance is and sustainability is, one alternative, and granted it's a very labor intensive alternative, would be to turn that lawn into a, a portion of an area where you can grow food. So, you know, this is a, a, a personal choice. Uh, I'm not anti-lawn, but what I'm trying to suggest is that whether you're growing a lawn or whether you're growing vegetables, as in this example, think about ways that you can do that that are resourceful and conservation oriented. And that will begin to give you a, a linkage 
into how you personally can begin to make choices and to combat you know, some of the systemic um, regional and global problems that we hear about in the news all the time. And so here's another example. Somebody's decided to turn their front yard, not um, have lawn anymore, but turn it into what we call a, a pollinator garden. And so that's a very loose, vague term. Um, and it sounds to me like already you are doing some of this work. And um, what a pollinator garden attempts to do is to place plant material that's gonna produce flowers or nectar, which then can be used by um, our insects and our birds, our pollinators for food. And it also provides habitat. Uh, and I dare say it also provides some beauty. And when we use a lot of native plants, we're helping to um, uh, sustain the native populations of insects and birds that provide some of those ecosystem services that we were just talking about. And here's another example. Now, Port Washington is a very interesting community. I've done quite a bit of work in Port Washington, both in the little village area and out on Sands Point. And you know, that there's a wide range of yard spaces and a wide range of economic um, wealth. And on some of these larger properties, what you'll see is that around the house are very groomed manicured landscapes. Many like the type my students at school uh, help to maintain. And then um, a growing phenomenon is to bring back you know, uh, natural uh, forbs and grasses and make sort of a drought tolerant landscape as you see here, um, based upon a meadow. And um, so here's another way it just to start thinking about how land use and management impacts our understanding of sustainability and can really impact this whole idea of your carbon footprint print, and um, climate change. So, you know, um, I wanna keep this mostly light, but I'm giving you some resources. And this is a wonderful way, if you really wanna start thinking about all of this and how scientists and engineers and architects and city planners organize all this information, you can go to the Sustainable Science Initiative website and you can download this scorecard. And this scorecard gives you various categories um, such as you know, design um, and then soils, vegetation, water, material selection, <clears throat> um, maintenance, et cetera, et cetera. Education is one of those. And you can learn exactly how you might systematically integrate uh, improvements, changes, designs into landscapes to make those areas sustainable. And uh, this is part of a voluntary rating system. You can get points for doing, uh, implementing some of these things. Now, most homeowners don't care about points and, and, and I don't necessarily care about the points either but corporations, institutions, they wanna feel like they're doing the right thing. And so whether you wanna do it to get notoriety or you wanna do it to educate yourself, this type of information is very helpful. So, um, so if you want, if you get bitten by the work that you're doing right now, you know, you can become part of this very important field. It's got a lot of different names. At Farmingdale, um, we have two concentrations. Um, if you study horticulture, we have general horticulture and we have landscape development. And so I um, mostly work in the landscape development program, but I also do teach plant ID courses and horticulture courses. And so I wanted to just kind of briefly go over, well, what do landscape designers do, you know? Does anybody know what a landscape designer does? 
Have you ever heard the term before? It's a very quiet crowd out there. Is a lamp to desire somebody who like um kind of um like like maps out like the the landscape of an area like like you know like the garden set up the, like the plant set up um how yeah how yeah, yeah, yeah. you're 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 getting to it. Essentially what a designer does is impose order um, onto, the, onto the earth, onto a site. So um, yes, there's mapping involved, there's analysis, there's looking at how the land functions, what kind of light, what kind of soils, who's, who the users are, and how you can put it into some kind of order. So it's a really cool profession. A lot of people don't quite understand what landscape design is, but it's you have to be familiar with what has gone on in the past, and you need to be able to visualize what's possible for the future. But you have to live in the moment that we live in right now. And we live in a tremendous area of the country, if not the world, where landscape design is very valued. So let me give you some examples. It could be something really small. Now that you're working on building gardens and maintaining landscapes, some of your family and friends may already know this and they may say to you when you, when you go to their house, <clears throat> hey, I'd like to do something different with my yard. You know, What could I do? So if you begin to learn about climate and soils and plants and light and what the nature of the of the of what people want to use their space for, you could begin to do what you see right here. And here's a little sketch down below. The question is which came first, the sketch or the photo? And the answer is that the little sketch was first. Somebody came up with this idea, you know, to make a little courtyard <clears throat> and to use geometric shapes for interest or, um, you know, for purpose. And then the photo up above is the result of um, the idea. So one of the things that I love to do, and you are very blessed, you know, to live where you do because Long Island has lots of public gardens and arboretums and as does New York City and public spaces. And so there's no one way to achieve a result to make a space fun and interesting, to transform it into your imagination. Yes, we need money to do that. Yes, we need willing people to allow us to do that. But once those are overcome, um, then we have the ability to create spaces. And this is a very famous space. Um, out in the Berkshires in Western Massachusetts. And it's designed by a landscape architect of some renown named Fletcher Steele. And what he did was he created a series of landings and steps to allow people to go from the top of, uh, of the hill here to the bottom. And surrounding all of that are these beautiful plants, these birch trees. Um, and it's kind of a processional way of going down a hillside. And it's really lush and it's beautiful. And it's an example of the imagination of a landscape architect to create a space that's fun to be in. So yes, what, what landscape designers and architects do is they look at raw space, they go out and analyze it and inventorying inventory what's there and then they come up with ideas that they put on paper and then they work out um, you know a result so it's a very sophisticated integrative um, profession that requires a lot of information um, which you can learn in school you can learn it on your own but it's really about integrating that those uh, sustainable principles as well. You wanna be ethical in terms of 
how what you're doing is going to tread lightly on the earth and provide good ecosystem services and make it a fun place to be. So if you really want to sum it up, landscape architecture or landscape design is this. People, the buildings, and the way we organize ourselves. That's what design is, and that's how um, you know, designers um, in, in, in the world of horticulture um, better the lives of others. So here's a little project I did a long time ago for a woman who was from Brooklyn, had moved um, to Rhode Island where I was based at that particular point and had a very posted stamp kind of yard. And what she wanted to do was first and foremost, be able to look out her window and see beauty. But secondly, also wanted to have a space that was broken into little separate spaces where she could interact and do all the things that all of us want to do in a yard. And so this was the end result. But what was really the challenge of the project was to understand where water falls when it rains and um, how to prevent that from going into the dwelling or the house. Um, and then to choose plant materials that would um, thrive, not just survive, and so there's a, there's a portion of uh, edible plants in here. There's a portion of aesthetic plants in here. And you can see that there's outdoor seating areas here. So when we think about design, it's really about a bunch of different things. You know, it's, you can look at this chart. You know, it's really about everything that we do in life. But keep in mind that it's also really about educating others. And it's really about ecology, how the planet functions. So, when that's my real takeaway for you all today, you know, is uh, many of your friends and, and maybe, you know, family members don't know that word ecology. And from what I understand you all are doing, you already are delving into the world of ecology. And what ecology thinks about are the sophisticated integrated natural systems that we don't really see on a general daily basis, but are very important to how um, um, we live as healthy beings. So it's about water quality, it's about soil conservation, it's about clean air, it's about keeping na nature intact or healing it. And it's really about the natural resources. And if we can think about ways that we can manage these and make them beautiful, we're gonna be happier people now and your children and your grandchildren will be happier and, and, and healthier in the future. So landscape is a wonderful metaphor, right? I hope all of you now, when you go to some of these properties, um, have a keener idea now of what you're looking at. So we can go out in the woods of the beautiful North Shore. I live um, in Glen Cove right now after living in Seacliff for a long time. And just like Port Washington, there's lots of woodsy areas. And we have streams and we have, um, you know, uh, estuaries and water bodies. And depending upon the time of year, we can see, you know, the intricacy of different kinds of plants. And we can take some of those ideas that we see in nature and we can bring them back into our home or our built environments. If we understand what we're looking at and why those plants are happy where they were in nature, we can then introduce those ideas back into our built landscapes. Now you might say, well, God, Long Island's kind of crazy, you know? And I agree, I'm not from Long Island. so the LIE and all the parkways, you know, make things really challenging, right? Because we have disturbed nature. And what we have are lots of different zones and sectors, but we also have little, what we call niches. So I don't know if, if anyone has been into Manhattan and has heard of the High Line. This is a, uh, an image of the High Line, which was an elevated rail line 
on the west side of Manhattan, um, along the Hudson, from 14th Street to about 34th Street. Oh, and I've been. You've been there? Yeah, isn't it exciting? <laughs> well, the highlight. It's really, really exciting. Not only is it exciting and beautiful, but it's revolutionary in a sense. It, it took um, a lot of people to save the high line, the elevated rail line, from being destroyed. And the reason they wanted to save it was, you know, Manhattan and, and all of the boroughs are very dense. And this is a photo from the 1990s before anything was designed. They were still trying to save it. And nature sowed its own, you know, field of plants with spontaneous plants in here. So this is a great example of how landscape uh, design and horticulture is a cool and an important profession. Because once the politicians were convinced by the citizens that this was uh, an asset, not a liability, um, designers had a competition and they submitted ideas like this and eventually a, a firm was chosen and they replanted the high line with a lot of uh, plants that are native, but not all, but also created spaces for people to enjoy. And they did all of that using what we call green infrastructure. And again, this goes back to the ecosystem services. The idea that we want to create new spaces that conserve, use, um, that those resources for better purposes. So a lot of it is about reclaiming rainwater. A lot of it is about soil building. And a lot of it is stopping um, uh, harmful pollutants from going into bodies of water, say like the Long Island Sound. Now, right up the road from all of you is Flushing and the Queens Botanic Garden. And I don't know if anybody's ever been there, but I really encourage you to go. It's not far from Fort Washington and they have a big educational program there. So if you're really bitten by some of the things you're learning about, you can go to, to the Queens Botanic Garden and you can learn, you become a master composter or you could learn how to make a rain garden or you could learn about teaching others about a lot of these issues. So um, really what I want to, you know, sort of let you know about is this is a vast profession. You know, some people want to study accounting or want to be a, a historian or want to be a doctor. Um, and while all of those professions also require lots of different skills, um, landscape architecture, horticulture um, really requires lots of different things. And I bet all of you already have understood the principle of design in some of the projects that you uh, are working on. So when you study all this, you're doing something for yourself, but you're doing something for others. So that's my spiel about um, landscape design and how it relates to horticulture. I do wanna just tell you that horticulture very briefly is really about growing and maintaining plants. And we have lots of courses at Farmingdale where you can learn about this and landscape design. And we have this teaching gardens on the campus. Um, it's about five acres, so it's big. And there's lots of different kinds of gardens there from very formal spaces like this with a lot of non-natives um, to woodland areas. Here's a little map of the teaching gardens. And this is my little garden at school. It's a half an acre. Um, and I call it the sustainable garden. And what we're trying to do is show people uh, some of the things I've been talking about. How can you grow a portion of your own food? How can you introduce um, native plants into a landscape? How can you conserve water? How can you build soil? Um, so it's kind of a rough and um, tumble kind of garden. You know, it's not a formal garden. So some people really like it. And I think some people 
kind of hate it. Um, this is a plan that students helped me to build, to design rather, about 10 years ago. And we've been working on implementing this plan. Um, we have a brochure um, in the past, but not this year. We've had students um, helping me to build um, the garden. Here's one of my students and we're planting uh, an orchard. Um, and so now the trees are quite big. We grow food here. We have the pollinators. Um, we um, in the past have grown cut flowers that we sell on campus. Sometimes we give them away to um, uh, nursing homes so people can enjoy the beauty of flowers. We promote this whole idea that a diverse garden is good for all of us. We have educational workshops. We sell honey because we have beehives in the garden. Um, but most importantly, for me anyway, the satisfaction that I get is to have projects that students can um, delve into and seek the solutions for real clients. So I call this curriculum-based learning. I know you're all in school and maybe when you're in school in science class or in ecology club, um, you get to work on real projects. And I know you are this summer and that's fantastic. So um, what we try to do, and this is a particular project that was done a number of years ago, students um, developed um, a bioswale or a rain garden to solve some of the storm water problems on the campus. So the students actually had a competition where I broke them into groups. This was the winning competition. And they came up with a design using native plants and then they actually installed the plants. So it was just, this is what it kind of looked like. Um, and um, what they ended up doing was creating a design. So they made the drawings and then they installed it. And this is what it looked like at the very beginning. It's not very showy. This is kind of what it looks like now. So it's a real habitat um, and um, it's a very interesting approach using primarily native plants. So I do this with other um, clients. So if you were to come to Farmingdale as an example, you're already learning about community service. Um, and I would love to have you help me with projects like this. This was a middle school that we worked with in Farmingdale. And we made, uh, we, turned, we turned this courtyard into a wildlife habitat garden. So each student in the class had to make a proposal, had to create a design, had to present their poster at a conference. And here are some of the teachers from the school oh, no. evaluating the projects. And then um, it was written up um, as a successful project on the campus in their alumni magazine. I didn't do it for those purposes. I did it for the kids that you see in the photos here who work at this, uh, who are students at this middle school. And we do all kinds of other projects. You know, sometimes um, we work in wetland areas. We explore what native plants are. Students really get into um, the minutia of mapping and, you know, studies. Last, uh, two years ago, we worked not too far from where you all are. Uh, we worked over in Matinecock for the North Shore Land Alliance. Um, we worked uh, building a sensory garden at the Clark Botanic Garden, which is not that far from all of you. Um, so we do those as, um, you know, general horticulture projects, but then the design students actually work um, on um, the drawing stuff too. So this is a part of our campus that's kind of bland. It's our library and um, it's a challenging space. Um, and students were all um, uh, required to analyze the space, make mappings, make landscape plans, make models. Um, use computer technology to show what possible uh, solutions could be out there. Lastly, I know because we're just about out of time, um, 
you know, the, all of this becomes important and possible when you can visualize how to do this. So if you come to Farmingdale, you can learn about computer assisted design and construction. And um, these are the important, you know, kind of non-sexy things that make all these projects work. So you learn the craft of, you know, making drawings and understanding how construction works and how to put it all together. And each student makes a, an independent project at the very end. So you learn how to conceptualize a project and present it to the general public and to make all the various drawings that are necessary and models um, so people can understand your ideas. So what I wanna leave you with today, and I want to add, thank you for uh, your time and the invitation to come here, is you're already doing things for yourself right now by being part of Rewild, and I'm thrilled to hear what you're doing. Um, what you can learn by doing, and I think personally that's the best way um, to become educated and to become impactful in the world. Should you want to come and, um, and, and study at a place like Farmingdale, we will help you to not only do something for yourself, but give you projects that will challenge you so that you can help others. And by doing that, you can also, also help the environment. And we now know so much about how in the New York area, because we're so built up, that we have destroyed a lot of habitat and we really need to um, repair that. So I hope that you will, as you, you know, learn more and as you further on your careers and you start thinking about college, that you might take a look at Farmingdale State College. So thank you so much for inviting me. Um, here's my contact information. If anybody wants uh, to ask a question or has a comment, I'm happy to uh, hear that right now. Um, and again, thank you so much for having me here. Thanks, thanks a lot, uh, Professor uh, Rockwell. This is great. I really appreciate uh, all of you staying on. And, and you, you know, you can connect a lot of things that you guys are doing at various places with this, from going to the SMLI garden to, you know, yesterday we were mulching and throwing wood chips on the ground, recycling stuff, plastic pots. We were composting out at SMLI. I mean, so all the things that we do are little skills and can, you know, use it in your own home, use it in your own spaces. And definitely, as Professor Baraka said, uh, consider driving this into a career or changing that into a passion around sustainability. Thanks a lot, everybody. Have, have yourself a wonderful week, and I'll see you, uh, I'll see you in the course of the week. Great. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.